Hello, and welcome to our session, Trending Issues, Innovations and Alternative Therapies to Dialysis, Xenon Transplantation. My name is Dale Rogers, and since the age of 12, I've managed kidney disease. Throughout my journey with kidney disease, I've received two kidney transplants and survived eight plus years of in-center dialysis, as well as peritoneal. I've gone through many of these treatment options while also achieving a professional career in management for a national food chain, as well as an IT specialist for my local county. I'm honored to serve the American Association of Kidney Patients as both a national ambassador and a member of the AAKP National Board of Directors, holding the officer position of secretary. I'm humbled knowing that I am part of the oldest and largest patient-led kidney patient organization in America, helping to make a difference for each and every patient suffering with kidney disease. I am involved with AAKP because I myself am a single voice, but being a member of AAKP makes me a part of a kidney voting constituent that Congress must take note of and make changes in policies recognizing patient voice, patient choice. I represent AAKP on the Coalition for Patients and Providers Advocates for Telehealth and the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients, SRTR, Patient and Family Affairs Subcommittee, helping patients learn how data can help improve their transplant options. Today I am pleased to honor Dr. David Cooper. Dr. Cooper is co-director of the Xenon Transplantation Program at the University of Alabama, Birmingham School of Medicine and one of the most recent prize winners of the Kidney X Artificial Kidney Prize for research in genetically engineering pig kidneys that will reduce rejection possibilities while providing more viable donor kidneys to patients in need. The AAKP is a staunch supporter of research and innovation. Kidney patients refuse to settle the dialysis status quo and want substantive roles in bringing new science and technology such as xenon transplantation, artificial implants, and wearable kidneys into the market to better enable them to improve their overall health and well-being and pursue their life goals and aspiration such as full or part-time employment, owning a home, providing for their families, or retiring securely. It is truly an honor to have Dr. Cooper join us today and discuss how xenon transplantation may be a possibility for the future. Dr. Cooper, I turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to address you. It's a great opportunity and I appreciate it very much. I'm going to talk today about a new idea, or it's an old idea, but it's a new, perhaps new to you. That is of using pigs as the sources of kidneys for transplantation into patients with renal failure. I think this will be a solution to the critical shortage of diseased human donors that have occurred over the last several decades. This is a slightly out outdated as it goes up to 219, but it's a, a, a database from the UNOS in the United States showing that at the moment there's something like 120,000 people waiting for a transplant of one organ or another uh, in the USA. About 100,000 of those are waiting for a kidney. But you can see in the red uh, line that this year there will be around about 40,000 organs available to those 120,000 people. Uh, and in the blue line, these, these come from about 20,000 um, deceased human donors. So the gap between the number of people awaiting and the number of people, uh, the number of organs that become available is still very, very considerable. Now, xenotransplantation uh, is the transplantation of organs between 
or tissues between species. And we are obviously interested in transplantation into humans. And I'm going to talk to you mainly about uh, transplantation of pig organs into humans. It's sometimes known as cross-species transplantation. Now, the first really scientific study of xenotransplantation was carried out by my late friend Keith Reemsma uh, in 1964. And he, at a time when dialysis was very limited in the country and when obtaining a deceased donor organ was also extremely difficult, uh, he decided he would transplant chimpanzee kidneys into patients. And he carried out six transplants. He put both chimpanzee kidneys into, each, into one patient carried out six, operated on six patients, and five of them did not do well. They survived perhaps six or so weeks and uh, either had severe rejection or because he gave so much immunospressin to overcome the rejection, they got an infection and died. But one patient remarkably lived for nine months, went out of hospital, went back to work as a school teacher and suddenly died at nine months, probably from an electrolyte disturbance, a disturbance of the salts in the body. Considering the limited immunosuppressive therapy they had in those days, this was quite a remarkable uh, um, result. Now, at post-mortem examination, at the top here, you see the two chimpanzee kidneys cut across, and they both look almost normal. There's virtually no signs of rejection. But at the bottom of the uh, figure, you can see the two native kidneys that are very shriveled very diseased and clearly not contributing to survival of that patient. So in 1964, at least one patient lived really quite well with chimpanzee kidneys. Now, chimpanzees and other non-human primates, there will be a number of problems in if we were planning to use those as sources of organs. Um, they would be uh, mainly logistical because there aren't many of them and ethical problems. So for a number of good reasons, since the mid-1980s, when I first became interested in this field of research, uh, we've decided for anatomical, physiological, logistical, and ethical reasons that pigs might be the preferable source of organs and cells for clinical transplantation. Now, from an ethical perspective, we've used pigs for our benefit for decades, or actually um, centuries. For example, for food, in the United States, well over 100 million pigs are killed each year as for food for the, the citizens of the, of the country. In China, they, reputedly, they slaughter 500 million pigs each year as sources of the anticoagulant drug heparin, which is isolated from the lungs and the liver. I used to be a heart surgeon and I often transplanted pig heart valves into patients. This has been done for at least 50 years and several thousand are done each year. And we use pigs as uh, if for medical research. So we're used to using pigs for these purposes. If we can put a heart valve from a pig into a patient, why can't we put a heart or a kidney into that patient? So from an ethical perspective, I don't think there would be a lot of criticism if we're using pigs for this purpose. Now, if we could overcome the immunological problems, the rejection of the pig organ, uh, we would obviously have an unlimited supply of organs. We could breed as many pigs as we want to. Equally important, the organs would be available electively. They'll be available tomorrow morning or this evening if we need them. You come in with your renal failure. You won't have to go on to dialysis for, for years and wait for the ki kidney. You'll have the operation next, next week. <clears throat> Similarly, most human deceased human donors have some sort of infection. They, 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 they carry various viruses like cytomegalovirus and so on, which can be transferred to the recipient of an organ from them and can lead to problems. But with pigs housed under biosecure, clean, isolated conditions, they will be known to be infection free. And so those risks will be minimized or negated. And finally, all, almost all human deceased donors have undergone brain death, which has significant detrimental effects to both the to, to the organs there. And so when you remove those organs, sometimes they're damaged or they're physiologically not functioning very well. 
That will obviously also be avoided if we're using pig organs because the organs will be removed from the pig when the pig is anaesthetized, would not undergo brain death. And what I haven't put on this slide is, but in some countries, particularly say Japan, there are cultural problems that means that people do not like to donate organs after death, but they don't have cultural problems with regard to using pigs for this purpose. So the number of transplants in those countries would go up enormously. Now, this is a pig kidney transplanted into a baboon. And pig kidneys have been transplanted into human patients in the past, in the 1960s. You can see it's nice and pink and it's uh, got a good blood flow and it's doing well. But within minutes, it could look like this, completely black. Uh, it's been, it, there's been thrombosis in the blood vessels, there's been hemorrhage into the tissues and the whole thing obviously stopped functioning within minutes, sometimes within five minutes. And this is known as hyperacute rejection and it's an immune reaction to the foreign tissue that occurs very rapidly. It can occur with human uh, kidneys, but it's, it's, it's uniform basically with pig kidneys. It's relatively uncommon with human kidneys. Now at that time, when we first started investigating this, Randall Morris, a good friend of mine who was a good researcher in this field, um, he came up with this quotation. He said, there are three golden rules for achieving successful xenotransplantation. But then he added, unfortunately, we don't know any of them. And at that time, he was absolutely quite right. Um, fortunately, now, 20 or more years later, we do know uh, uh, the solutions to some of these problems. Now, at that time, Klaus Hammer, who was a German veterinary surgeon, as well as a, a, a medical doctor, <clears throat> He pointed out that humans and pigs have evolved separately for the last 80 million years. And so what we're really trying to do now is to outwit evolution. We're trying to correct that 80 million years of difference so that the two species are much more compatible. Now, what is the cause of this very rapid rejection? Well, in this simple chart, the, um, the, the curved line at the bottom of the picture is the edge of the pig cell the, or the pig blood vessel because it's the cells on the blood vessels that will be first uh, um, exposed to the human blood. And sticking out from there, you can see these things marked pig sugars. These are carbohydrates, uh, molecules which against which humans have these antibodies de 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 depicted here. So as soon as that organ is reperfused with human blood, these human antibodies that are already in the blood bind to those pig sugars and begin a process uh, which causes very rapid rejection. Um, I won't go into the details, but it's a very rapid uh, sequence of events. So these antibodies in human blood, they bind to three known carbohydrate molecules, as I say, antigens on the pig cells. And these three are a ga a ga a galactose one, which is similar to glucose, a, uh, um, a, a, a n alarm neuraminic acid and, and a, an SDA, which is a rare sort of blood type. So there are three carbohydrates that's on the surface of each pig cell. And as soon as they're recognized by the human, the human's antibodies bind to them, activate the rejection response. Now, as I say, that binding of these antibodies to these antigens initiates a cascade of events, including complement, coagulation, all sorts of things that leads to the destruction of the pig graft. Now, why do we develop these antibodies? Because they're there in infancy um, and we've never been exposed to pigs at that stage of our lives. And people who've never eaten or been in touch with pigs, they have developed these antibodies as well. Well, they're actually a protective mechanism against microorganisms that colonize our gut in infancy. And unfortunately, those microorganisms, or some of them, have the same sugars on the surface of their cells that the pig does. So we are primed to prevent these microorganisms causing any problems to us. But unfortunately, that means that we're also primed to reject that pig kidney as soon as it's put in. Now, using genetic engineering techniques, which are really now quite sophisticated, we can knock out all three of those carbohydrates so the pig no longer expresses those three sugars. Uh, and that results in minimal or no antibody binding. Now, this shows you what I'm trying to, to say here. In the top picture, you can see at the, near the bottom of the, 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 the figure is a dotted red line. That means there's no antibody binding beneath that line. 
But you can see during the first year of life, it's up to one year, we're beginning to develop antibodies against the peak. Okay, and you can see in adults on the right hand side, we have really quite high levels of antibody. It goes up to on this scale that don't worry what the units are, but it goes up to 200. Now on the bottom chart, this is antibody binding to pig cells where these three sugars have been knocked out. And you can see the dotted line is still there at 1.2, but the scale on the left hand side is now totally different. It's from zero to 2.5. Whereas in the top, it was zero to 200. And you can see even then, most of those infants and, uh, in the first year of life have no antibody binding to those pigs at all, or to those pig cells. And even adults have extremely low levels. Here we've got one that has 1.5, whereas in the upper chart, we have 200. So the amount of binding to those triple knockout, what we call the triple knockout TKO pigs cells is minimal compared with binding to wild type normal genetically unmodified pig cells. Now, in addition to that, which obviously reduces the risk of rejection enormously, but in addition to that, we can put into the pig cell human protective genes, which provide added resistance to rejection. For example, when we activate our own system to destroy microorganisms, viruses and bacteria and so on that get into our blood, that response doesn't damage our own tissues. And the reason is because we have these human protective genes on our own blood vessel uh, uh, vessel walls, which protect ourselves. The pig has pig protective genes, but they're not very effective against human, the human immune response. And you can see in this micros micro microscopic picture on the right hand side, you can just see a very fine little needle going into that pig cell and we can inject through that needle human genes which when that cell is developed into a whole pig that means the pig will express these protective uh, human uh, genes and that gives us added protection in addition to the knockout of the uh, three sugars. And these pigs are healthy, uh, they breed well, there's no problems with them. We now have pigs with 10 or more genetic manipulations, the three knockouts and seven additional protective genes. Now, very, very importantly, this is our first opportunity in 70, year, 70 years of transplantation to modify the donor rather than just treat the recipient. To date, all we can do is immunosuppress the recipient to, put, to suppress the immune response to the donor organ. And the more immunosuppression we give, the more there is a risk of complications from that immunosuppression, as you probably know. The more we can do to the donor, the less we have to do to the recipient. And I firmly believe that in due course, eventually we will be doing everything to the pig donor and we won't have to treat the recipient at all, which will be the ideal circumstance. Today, however, we do have to give some immunosuppressive therapy. The conventional therapy that we use for human organ transplants is inefficient in protecting against the pig organ. But there are some new agents coming available, not yet FDA approved, that are much more efficient in xenotransplantation. And as I mentioned, with further genetic engineering, I predict that eventually no immunosuppressive therapy will re be required. Now, this will take a few years, um, just as it's taken a few, many years, decades, for us to get to the state we are in now with human deceased organ transplantation. But I think this will happen. Now, if it's successful, this is a serum creatinine, which you know is a good indicator of, um, of uh, kidney function. And you can see up to about nine months in these cases, these three cases, two of them did very well. One did get some rejection in the middle, and I, to be honest, I can't quite remember why that was the case. The other two we had to terminate because they got some infections. But uh, other people have now got over, a, uh, other labs have got over a year now with good function of their kidneys. So those kidneys work very well. The pig kidney works very well in baboons or monkeys. Uh, and I'm sure it will work just as well in, in human recipients. And you can see from this chart, this gives the maximal survival of a pig kidney in a non-human primate uh, each year. 
And you can see that in the last five or six years, we have done made, made major improvements. We've now survival over a year in some cases. Um, and this is largely because we've got better and better peaks. And we've also now got these new immunosuppressive drugs that are uh, very efficient. So having made this progress in the laboratory, we're now beginning to consider which patients would we offer to participate in the first clinical trials. I think eventually all the patients will be, um, would benefit from people organ transplantation. But what will we, which patients would we, we ideally select to participate in the first clinical trials? And we suggest that it will be those who will probably never receive a deceased human donor kidney. They may be on the waiting list, but the chances are they will never receive one. Now here you can see, if you look on the right in the red, the wait list while on dialysis. These are patients who are on the waiting list for a kidney in the United States while they're obviously receiving dialysis. And that's the blue line that comes down to the red writing. And I, I, I don't want to shock you too much, uh, particularly if you're a patient who's waiting on the waiting list, but you can see that uh, if you're on the list for more than five years, you have about a 40% chance of not being on that waiting list at that time. You've either died or you've developed some complications and the medical team feel you're no longer a suitable candidate for a transplant, so you're taken off that list. And if you're on the waiting list for longer than five years, which is not uncommon, some patients are on the waiting list for eight, nine years, uh, obviously the mortality increases. So there are patients who, although they're on the waiting list and they're patiently waiting for a, a donor organ, and you can often predict who these patients are because of their blood group or their age or their geographic um, location and so on. There are patients who you think are very unlikely to survive in a good healthy state so that they can actually undergo a kidney transplant. So those are the patients we feel that might benefit from a peak organ transplant. Rather than be on dialysis for a few years, maybe they would take the chance of having a peak organ transplant, a peak kidney transplant, which would get take them off dialysis. We don't know, of course, for how long that peak kidney will survive in a patient but our data suggests it would survive a lot longer in a patient than it does in a non human primate. I won't go into that, but that's how that data suggests that. So let's say we get a year or two uh, or perhaps longer uh, where that pick is doing very well. That's a couple of years. The patient is no longer on dialysis and may take them to the point when they get a human transplant. So we would be using that pig kidney initially as a, a bridge rather than dialysis, which is being used as a bridge to get them to the point where they can get a human transplant. Eventually, of course, we wouldn't need the human transplant. We just have the peak organ and leave it there. Now, what does the public and what do patients think about this? My colleagues here at UAB uh, have done a, a number of surveys and focus group studies of patients and members of the public and members of the religious communities, etc., cetera, um, in the past two or three years. And the results have generally been positive. Patients um, uh, and the public generally are positive about xenotransplantation if the results would be in any way comparable to transplantation of a human kidney. And this is especially so, as you'd probably expect, in patients in need of an organ graft and their families that support people. Um, the man in the street who thinks he's never going to need an organ transplant is less positive about it than patients who know that they will need a transplant. Our main interest at the moment is to be able to solve the problem of terminal kidney failure. But obviously, xenotransplant has the potential to cure a lot of other conditions or to treat a lot of other conditions. Any organ failure, heart or liver failure, could be treated by transplanting the pig heart or the pig liver. And there's a lot of work going on in those fields. Patients with diabetes could be treated by transplanting pig islets, pancreatic islets that actually produce insulin. And we know pig insulin works very well in patients. Uh, and this is a, a possibility. And I might mention, of course, patients with terminal kidney failure through diabetes 
could have both. They could have the pig kidney and the pig eyelids and treat both of their conditions. And there's been some very good work on monkeys with a Parkinson-like disease, uh, treating them with pig dopamine producing cells. So Parkinson's disease, which affects, I think, about 7 million people in this country, uh, could be cured by pig uh, uh, cell transplantation. There's a lot of been work on, we've done some work on corneal blindness using pig corneas as the source of the uh, graft. And we've also done some work on using pig red blood cell transfusions instead of humans, which would mean you'd have pig cells available. You wouldn't have to blood type them because all the pigs are of blood type O, the universal donor. And so in an emergency, you might want to use pig red blood cells. We've also done some work looking at sickle cell disease uh, in that respect. Now, I mentioned di diabetes, and I just give you this one example in this chart. The blue lines or the blue lines are the blood sugars of the of the monkeys. These are diabetic monkeys. You can see on the left hand side, the blood sugar is anything from 100 up to 400 or even nearly 500 on certain days. As soon as we put the eyelids in, where it's marked there, TX, the blood sugar in this monkey came down and for a year was in the normal range. Didn't need any insulin at all during that year. It controlled the blood sugar uh, completely. Uh, and then we terminated the experiment. It's not always successful as this, but it, but it can be. So the potential of treating diabetes uh, with a peak eyelid transplantation is very considerable. Now, many years ago, I lived in Oklahoma for a few years. And for somebody from South London in the UK, I did my best to become an Okie, as you can see here. Now, I was very impressed by this Native American proverb that I heard in Oklahoma. Timing has a lot to do with the success of a rain dance. There's no point in going out to do a rain dance unless you've checked with the weather channel beforehand. And I think that's very sage advice. And timing has a lot to do with the success of xenotransplantation. And I think we now the timing is right. We have these multi-genetically engineered pigs. We have good immunosuppressive drugs. And I think the timing to do a clinical trial is getting very close. Now, my former senior colleague when I was at the University of Pittsburgh, Tom Starzl, who some of you may have heard of because he was one of the greatest pioneers in organ transplantation, both kidney and liver. Uh, he has a, a quote which I'm going to show you now. He says that history tells us that procedures that were inconceivable yesterday, such as xenotransplantation, and are barely achievable today, such as xenotransplantation, often become routine tomorrow. And I think this is very true. And I think very soon, xenotransplantation will become routine. So I firmly believe that xenotransplantation, given its potential with renal failure, heart failure, diabetes, uh, Parkinson's disease, etc., will be the next great medical revolution that we experience. And one day, transplantation of deceased human donor organs will become of historic interest only. And people will say, do you know, once upon a time, they transplanted organs from people who are dead. Uh, and I think uh, they will look back on this as, as a weird era in medical therapy. Now, I firmly believe that we're at a point now that a clinical trial will be initiated within the next two years. I would further say that I think we'll learn much more from a clinical trial than we can now from the transplants in non-human primates. There are multiple problems with, with, with experiments in non-human primates. The, uh, the, the, the primates, of course, cannot communicate with us. We don't know if they're not feeling well. We don't have sophisticated methods of monitoring those we do with patients. We don't have intensive care units, etc., etc. So I think we will learn very much more uh, when we move to the uh, to, to begin a clinical trial, a very small initial clinical trial, just to make sure it's safe and successful, I think would be highly warranted. So I think the pig will eventually become our good friend and benefit to the human society. So I thank you very much indeed for your attention. And again, I thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity of speaking to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Cooper, for an informative perspective. 
Your research gives patients hope. And when there is hope, we can overcome <clears throat> the most difficult of situations. Thank you all for joining us.